Here's Ellen. All right. So let me get here. All right, so good morning. And so welcome to my class on lumen printing and solography. Um, these are alternative uses for darkroom paper. Um, so as we go along, if I get into something that's too jargony or you just don't understand, uh, you know, just let me know and I'll um, clarify. Um, so I will also admit, I don't know everything, sorry. <laughs> so if there, there might be questions I might not be able to, to answer. Um, but uh, alt process, or I'll see, there we go, jargon. Um, alternative processes are not, they're not always easy to teach in a, in a short session, especially over Zoom, but the process that we're gonna go over today, they're uh, pretty introductory. They're fairly easy to, um, uh, to get into. Um, you don't have to uh, have darkroom chemistry unless you choose to, and uh, which is good because we can't teach that over Zoom, <laughs> but I will briefly go over it. So let me share my screen. Uh, let's see, host. Oh, yes. <laughs> let me get you into hosting. Let's see. Okay. 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 Can you all see that? Yep. Yes. Lumen printing and solography. Okay. Awesome. There we go. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, great. All right, so um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ellen, and I really I absolutely love working with um, alternative photographic process because for me, I I really like the challenge of it. Um, I spend a lot less time at a computer and more time work, working with physical objects, and there's a, a lot of failure, a lot of mistakes, but when it works out you know, the payoff can be really wonderful. Um, some of my very best work has been made with alternative processes. Um, and, uh, you know, and it, it requires comfortably being with imper imperfection and failure and then taking those failures and figuring out what direction to take them in. You know, or maybe it's just the lesson is, okay, that didn't work you need to try something else. And, you know, so, but sometimes the failures and the mistakes, they create something that you never, take it in a direction you never would have thought of. Uh, just as a quick example, um, I used a, a UV light table, you know, so artificial UV light to expose fabric that had been treated with UV light sensitive solution. But the fabric was longer than the bulbs and so the exposure kind of faded off in the areas that didn't, you know, that were longer than the bulb, but that kind of acted like as, as a vignette. And then it kind of had like fate, kind of faded the out the edges and it really brought the whole thing together in a way that I wouldn't have imagined. So that's just an example of why I love all processes. So, um, so first I'm gonna talk a little bit about darkroom paper. Um, I'm not gonna go, completely nuts, but just to give you an overview. Um, and then I'll talk about the lumen printing process and then about the solography process and how to build a basic pinhole camera, which I'll actually demo to you. All right. Um, so with in this, in the, for this class, I will, when I'm talking about darkroom paper, it will be uh, in reference to black and white darkroom paper. Um, and it's, it's most readily available, it's easiest to work with. 
Um, so when you store, so here I have all kinds of darker paper and you can see they are all in envelopes and um, they all have light proof envelopes to kind of, to, you know, obviously store them from light. So when I store, I, when I handle darkroom paper, um, I make sure to do it in very, very low light or even some cases. And I also have what a light changing tent here. So I'm actually able to put the paper into the little tent. And then I'm able to put my arms in. So I'm able to stay in the light that I'm able to work with items in a light proof container. So, and, you know, I try and keep, store it in a cool, dark place, and that'll help extend the life of the paper. Um, and when I handle the paper, I try and handle the edges of it. And um, so I try, try not to get fingerprints on the emulsion side. Um, when working with darkroom paper, it's really important to make notes about what you're doing, what kind of paper you're using, because you don't have, there's no embedded metadata. Um, so, for example, it's like I make notes on the back of this envelope about what it'll do during a lumen process. And I have papers here where I make notes on the back saying what kind of paper it is because once you have multiple types of paper and you shuffle them around, you don't know what's what. Um, and when you handle the darkroom paper, if you're not, there's the side that exposes and the side that doesn't. And when you're handling it in the dark, how do you know which is which? So one side will be kind of shiny or smoother. And then that's, that's kind of, that's your emulsion side. Um, black and white paper isn't designed to be exposed to UV light. Um, and so when it is exposed to UV light, especially for longer periods of time, it will start to turn these wild colors. Like there's purple, it's kind of a gray, blue, brown, kind of an orange kind of a color. So, and it's just, and it, it's, so it's just a really interesting process and you don't always know what you're gonna get out of the paper. Um, so how do you choose a dark room paper? How, I mean, would, if you go out and you try and buy black and white dark room paper, there are so many choices and it can be kind of overwhelming. And so with the processes that we're going to be doing, honestly, it doesn't really matter that much, um, but um, I'll, I'll briefly go over it. Um, so, um, RC, sorry, I just knocked it over. <laughs> um, so RC is in a, in a more inexpensive paper. It's really good for beginners. Um, if you're into dark room, black and white photography, um, it's, it's called RC stands for resin coated. So it has this kind of shiny, glossy surface. And, um, when it dries, it's still very, the edges are still very straight and very clean. Um, and then there's fiber paper, which is, you know, has, you know, like it can have like cotton fibers. It, so it's a more, it's a sturdier paper and it's a thicker paper and it's a beautiful paper too. Um, but when it dries, you can see that the edges are a little bit more warped. And then there's, um, and, it, and um, the fiber paper, it can come in matte, it can come in glossy, and it can kind of come in the semi-gloss as well, or luster, and they call it pearl. There's all these different names. Um, and papers, they can have a warm or cool tone base so that'll skew to one or the other. That can have possibly have more of an effect when you do it for lumen printing. Um, there's also a, um, Oh, also in the ISO for a lot of these papers, they tend to be between one and three. So very, very, you know, slow ISO. Um, and there's a company called Ilford. They make good papers, good films. Um, they have a paper that's called Obscura Paper and it's actually specifically designed for pinhole photography. Um, 
so they kind of gear it a little bit towards it. I have not used it before, so I don't know what working with that paper is like, but I think it's great that it's an option that's available. There's also a paper called Direct Positive. So what that means is if you use the paper to make an image in a pinhole camera with regular darkroom paper, the image is kind of, it's, it's going to be reversed. It's going to come out like a negative, but this direct positive, it will do the opposite. It will produce a positive image. So, and I have also not worked with that paper before. But, um, you know, you can have a uh, paper can be expired, it can be new, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, so if you find some at a garage sale or something, or somebody's giving it away for free, you know, that's a really, it's a really good way to use the paper. All this paper I got for free. All right, um, so we're on to lumen printing. Um, so lumen prints, um, so they're basically, there's, they're just another type of photogram. And what a photogram is, is you create a photographic image on black and white paper, or, you know, darkroom paper without a camera. You know, you, you have a piece of paper and then you can take objects and you can arrange it on top of the paper and then you expose it. And, um, you can also use, um, you can use film negatives, you can use transparency sheets. And um, this image, it was a test strip, honestly, but this is, but I did use the transparency for that to create that image. Um, and so when it gets exposed to UV light, like I mentioned, it can change to all these wild colors and you know, with all these papers, it's like you don't know beforehand what colors it's going to turn or what it's going to do. Um, and then when you, um, let's see. Yeah, so like I said, we turn pink or blue, blue, gray, orange. It just depends on the tape of paper and its age. Um, so when you are creating a lumen print, um, when you arrange objects on top of it, another thing you can do is you can use, um, it's called a printing frame. So there's a back, like a, a solid back and then a glass piece that, you know, you can use to like um, make tighter an object or a transparency or a negative to make tighter contact with the paper because the tighter the contact you, an object has with the paper, the sharper um, and more dense it will be. Um, and so when you have objects that are a little bit away from the paper, then it can create um, like shadows and a little bit of dimensionality as well, which you, in the example on the screen, that is objects that are, it's like they, there's parts of it that have had firm contact and others that have kind of objects that are a little bit not directly on the paper. So it kind of really gives that soft edge and it's, um, and so the type of light source you use will also really um, have an impact. If you use the sun, um, then it's going to depend on where you're, where, you, where you're located in the world. It's going to be very different if you're in Alaska versus Ecuador. Um, and, you know, the time of year, cloudy and all that kind of thing. Um, and so if you place, so if you have your paper, and you place an object on it, as the sun moves, it's going to shift, the direction of the light will shift. And then that can also create some really interesting patterns that way. So if you have an artificial UV light source, I will show you here. I think this is you, my um, homemade UV light box. Sorry. Um, and it's just basically, it's foam core, some insulation and, um, just some a uh, strip of UV light. They're like um, LED type, and and the advantage uh, of that. Where do you get the UV lights? What those? Um, I I actually got those on Amazon. Um, okay. They were just uh, I just looked up LED light, and it came on just like a thin little ribbon. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's kind of, a, you can totally buy the bulbs and those will work as well. Um, 
those that just happen to be really convenient for yeah. my needs. So. Um, but the nice thing about that, you know, and, and I did used to live in Alaska and um, I had to use the UV table up that they had at the art department at the university. Uh -huh. That's what I had to use quite a lot. Um, and then advantage of that, it's a, it can be a little slower, but the light source, it's steady and you can get some repeatable results. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. So you, do you just experiment with how much time you, you leave it under the lights? I do. Um, oftentimes, I find, you know, 30 minutes for me seems to be a, a pretty good amount of time. And um, sometimes it can go longer. Sometimes you can just let it cook and it doesn't seem to be detrimental to it. But I also find if you don't do it quite long enough, then, um, you know, it might not you know, produce, you know, the color might not like fully develop. Oh, and that is another thing I almost forgot to mention. So, oh, wait, no. Okay, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, anyway, so um, I wanted to show you a couple examples. Um, so you can, on the left is the before and on the right is the after. And on the left, I'm not sure how they got those awesome colors. They might have actually just digitally altered it, but I don't know. The one on the right, that is one of mine, and I did not alter that. And so when you finish a lumen print, when it's done exposing, um, you have to be, you have to stop the exposure. You have to like fix it as it's you know called in dark room. Um, so there are a couple methods that you can do this and they will make a, quite a difference. So um, if you don't have darkroom chemistry and if you're not, you don't want to work with it, that's not a problem at all. It's actually easier because um, you can, once it's done exposing, um, you just take it and scan it and you don't want to do a preview. You want to set it at a higher setting than you normally would. You want, because you basically, I just wanted to, you just really want to limit the number of times you scan it because it's a bright exposure to light and each exposure will further, you know, degrade the print. So I try and do one really high quality scan and then I call it good. Um, and if you don't have access to a scanner, you can just take a photograph of it. Um, you can, um, you can, uh, set it up against the wall to get it kind of square with your camera. And then, um, you know, or you can put it on the floor and hold your camera straight down, but you want to try and get a, a parallel between the two to make it uh, to get it as square as possible. Um, and the third method is to act to use actual darkroom chemistry to fix it. And so, and that's what the chemicals generally is called as they call it a fi is fixer. Um, and so that will stop the exposure. But what that does to a lumen print like this is it will dramatically change the color. Um, like this, these are all fixed. And these all had very different colors when they were initially printed. Um, this had a really, really beautiful kind of pink and there were hints of blue in there. And then I put it into the chemistry and then it kind of turned this orange color. And I wasn't, I wasn't particularly thrilled with the color, but it is what it is. Um, and so uh, sometimes what I do is I actually scan it. So I'd get that color, so I'd get the color from the initial fin uh, print finish. And then I would go throw it in the fixer. So I got the best of both worlds. So I wanted to do a quick demonstration with lumen printing. So I have one of my favorite papers here by, by Berger. Uh, let's see, I hope you can see. So what I do is I'll get this set up and then we'll let it cook for half an hour and then we will come back to it. 
so I have um, some of these million dollar leaves. I really like using these to print because they have, you know, because they're semi-transparent, semi-opaque, but then they have parts that are not. And then I just have this piece of glass that I is just a slumped piece of glass as a little tray. And I thought those two might make an interesting, they might make an interesting combination. So make this quick. All right, very briefly, slightly yellowed. I'm gonna take this, just gonna set it over. Got my artificial UV light source, bam. All right, and with this, I just plug the cords in together and it's cooking. So we'll let that sit for about half an hour. Can we peek under the box and see what the lights look like when they're on? Oh, sure. Cool. Yeah, like a little raven there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Set that timer. Go. All right. So we'll come back to that. In the meantime, we will go on to solography. Um, so this is a fairly new process. It's you know it's like 20, 25 years old. And apparently it was invented in Poland. And it's still very particular with Polish alternative process photographers, which that's quite a niche for you. And, um, and it's actually made because of digital, possible because of digital technology. Uh, because fixing these images in a, in a chemical bath, um, which changes the colors, um, it will often make it too dark and it ruins your image and which you really do not want to do because these are very long exposure Im images you know and what they do, and they can be you know you know you can be have it up for a couple of days but you can have it up for a year and what it does it's a long exposure and what it does is each day it records the path of the sun and as it transverses the sky Every each day, it just creates a little line on the image that you can see here. That all that green, that's about six months worth of you know the path of the sun, and you can see where I started in summer. It's even actually it's got a little bit of that orange red glow in there, and then by the time I pulled the camera, it's all the way. It's you know kind of like this blue purple pink kind of a color, and so it's just. To me, I find it's, and let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. Yeah, so where you can see all those fine little lines where it almost looks like a vinyl record, that is the path of the sun each day. Woo, all right. Um, so, and these are take, these images, they're taken with, a basic pinhole camera and um, you, you know which it's just basically it's just a little light proof box with a tiny hole and a piece of darkroom paper you know and this goes back to the very very fundamentals of photography um, so how a pinhole camera works it's you know is camera obscura uh, and this is this is you know been known since at least antiquity uh, camera obscura means dark room or dark chamber in Latin, and it's just basically what I described. It's a little tiny room or a chamber or box with a tiny hole, and then the light projects into the little room, and it flips the image upside down, and that's actually exactly what our eyes do. Um, and a little side note, the Latin camera obscura means dark okay. room. Camera means room and obscura means dark. So when we talk about our cameras, we're talking about little rooms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and which is true, a lot of them are little teeny tiny rooms. So, um, you know, but so that image is projected upside down. Um, so our brains flip it the right side up. Um, our cameras, they have, you know, one reason why they have mirrors. So they, 
so the image shows the right way up. And with pinhole cameras, yes, the image projects down, but you just take the paper out and turn it around and you're good. Um, <laughs> and so the other part that I, st I still have, don't know how it works and I still haven't found a good answer is how a piece of darkroom paper and a little camera, a little pinhole camera can sit there for a year and not get completely blown out. And you know, the image, the scene is preserved. And the only thing that, you know, is just the path of the sun gets etched into that paper every day. And what's that? Sorry, the cat is very much participating in this meeting. Oh, good. Well, I, I would assume, you know, there's at least one cat. I had to put mine away because <laughs> he's too cute <laughs> and too distracting. So. Um, but it wouldn't be a meeting with a Zoom meeting without a cat. <laughs> so anyway, so I, I chalk up to the pinhole camera being able to, um, you know, not to be able to have a year long exposure. I chalk it up to witchcraft. Of course, I'm kidding. But, <laughs> but I wanted to show you some examples of the solography. Um, I think this is my favorite example I've ever come across. And I know I'll never make one this cool. <laughs> so I'm just going to enjoy this one. Um, this was by Jip Labermount. I am sure I'm butchering his name, but he's Dutch. This is another one of his image with another dinosaur and I'm very jealous of this. <laughs> um, and so when you're, when the cameras are out there, they, you know, they're exposed to the elements and sometimes they get wet. And I think, you know, it can create some really cool effects. So I, I couldn't find this, the scan, but one of mine got wet and it had this kind of almost the skull-like image in there. It was really interesting. Yeah, I just love this one as well. So cool. So I am now going to show you how to build a pinhole camera. And I do not recommend using a nice pre-made expensive pinhole camera when you spend a lot of time on because, you know, it has to withstand the elements, it can get lost, it can get stolen. And I am completely serious when it, I would say it can be destroyed by a bomb squad because there are probably, a, you know, if you Google like pinhole camera or solography pinhole camera bomb, you'll get about a half a dozen stories of, you know, people thinking that these little pinhole cameras are bombs. And so they call it the bomb squad. And yes, to be fair, it does look rather suspicious. Um, I, so my family owns a business and a building in downtown Grass Valley. And so it's a tall building. And so I put one of these out on our fire escapes, you know, so we're three stories above the ground. Um, and then I told my mom what I was doing, but she didn't know what these looked like. And so she went out there for something and she's like, what is this? It's like, she's like, I don't understand. It's like, are they running drugs or what are they doing? I don't, and so, so she was freaking out that we had drug runners climbing up on our fire escape. So, um, and, and then, um, and then what I do is since it's, a, it's such a long-term commitment is I make a bunch of them. I probably, I've probably made about a dozen of them. I actually got around to putting out like five or six, but I, anyway. But it ups your chances of getting something because when you place these, you, you not, you're not, you don't know exactly what your framing is. You're taking, you're just taking your best guess. So it just increases your chances of getting something good. All right, so I will stop sharing for a moment. Okay. And I will send out like a parts list or a supply list for this. I meant to get that done before, but I just didn't. So, um, So 
I have a tall aluminum can. Um, this is like a 23 ounce. I, um, you know, there's, I rarely recommend a tall can because that's going to give you more space for your, um, to, for your image. Um, you know, and then these, I just, I got this at um, Save Mart for like 89 cents and I just like the design on it. So that's why I got that one. And make sure it's, you want it empty, clean and dry. Uh, can opener. And so we wanna take the top of this off, but we wanna leave this little edge here, not only because it gives structural support, but also because there is a cap. Because we're gonna have to create a cap to go over it. And when you put the cap on, having this little bit of a lip makes it easier to slide on. So the easiest way to actually open this is to use a can opener. Take off the tab. There, Bob's your uncle. All right. So, okay. So, and then just watch out for any little sharp edges, little sharp bits there, and you can just clip those off with the scissors if you need to. So we have our empty top. So the next thing we'll need to do is create a cap. Um, so you're going to need paper of some sort. I recommend like dark, you know, black construction paper. I personally like to use the backing papers for medium format film because it's, it's a little, it's tough and it's flexible and it's really, and it's definitely light proof. And then I either gaffer's tape or duct tape or something that's going to be light proof and waterproof. Got scissors and a little bit of tape just to kind of start it. Um, so I won't go through the whole process of, the, of building the cap because that can take, you know, probably a good, you know, five, 10 minutes. But what I do do, um, but I will give you some tips. So I just wrap it around and I measure the amount. And you don't want to you don't want to make this too tight because if you do, it makes it very hard to pull it off and pull it, put it back in. I have several that I actually need to remake caps because I made them too tight. So, but you still want it to be kind of firm. So I just do it where it's just a little bit snug. And so I get that going. Now, when I start, and then I would also cut out a piece that goes over it. And then I just take tape and I just keep covering it until the tape kind of covers the whole thing. And then it creates this little cap. But when you are first starting to tape, especially down at the bottom, you really want to make sure that when you tape, you don't tape below the paper because then you've, then you've got a problem. So you want to make sure you leave a little bit of a look at the bottom a or a little bit of paper down at the bottom. Oh, you, you can slide it in and out. And so, and this just involved lots of taping, just tape it around, tape it over the top until eventually you get something that looks like this. <clears throat> yeah, so this one, it just slides in and out. Now, what we need to do next is to create a pin, the pinhole. Excuse me, so, Ellen, I just saw Anne had a question. Oh, uh, what's that? I, I'm sorry, Ann, I didn't see the question. It didn't light up on my thing. I just noticed it by rechecking. Um, so it was back 13 minutes ago. So I think it was a contact friend. How long would you leave it outside if you don't make a box? I think she means a UV box. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Outside so, in the sun. 
a lot in the sun. Um, you know, it really depends on the strength of the sun and kind of where I feel like it's a bright, sunny summer day. You know, you could probably, you know, 10, 15 minutes if it's like, if it's later in the day or if it's in the fall or something, yeah, probably half hour, hour maybe. Um, and you can also, oh, the other thing that you can do is you take your paper and you can also do test strips. So you can um, expose, put your paper out in the sun with covering with it a piece of paper and then you let it sit for 10 minutes. And then after 10 minutes, you slide the paper over a little bit, let it expose for another 10 minutes, let it slide over and let it expose for another 10. And then, then you, that can give you a general idea of how long you want to let it expose for. Yeah, test strips. And I would recommend a little piece of cardboard. The paper might be too transparent. That's true. Yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. All right. And um, what I would also recommend doing when, for that test strip is just like like down on the like on the back, just write down, you know, like if what the exposures were, you know, it can be like 10 minutes, you know, like 10 minute, 20, 30, et cetera. So then that way, when you go back and look at it, you know, a month later, you're not going, oh God, what was this? <laughs> so, okay. So for making a pinhole for this, you kind of want it about halfway down. And one thing I like about this particular can is there's a little Japanese lady playing a musical instrument and her mouth is right at about the halfway point. So with this type of can, you know, I can put the pinhole in the same place if I want and get it really you know, consistent. Um, so to make a pinhole, you take a pin and I got this little one for, um, out of my sewing equipment. And it actually, and I like these because there's a little ball at the end. And so it makes it a lot more comfortable to handle the pin. And then I just literally try to dry the pin. I don't wanna like stab it all the way through because with pinholes, you, you really, the smaller the hole, the sharper and finer the image. So I want to just, I, what I'm kind of, as I'm putting a little bit of pressure on it. So even a thumbtack push pin would be too wide of a hole. It could, yeah, it could, yeah. I mean, it also to really, if you, I mean, you probably could do that, but it, um, it probably would be too bright. And then once you've created your little teeny tiny hole, and there's no way, I can barely see it. So you're not gonna be able to see it. <laughs> um, so one, because you push the, knee, the needle through the metal, it's, you know, it's pushed out metal on the other side. So there are little burrs where the hole is. Now you can leave those and it'll create some interesting, it could create some interesting effects. But what I usually do, so I grab a little bit of sandpaper and because my fingers aren't long enough to reach down there, I'd grab, um, you know, I'd, in this case, I'm using a pen or I might use a popsicle stick and I'll take the sandpaper on the inside and I'll actually sand it so that it smooths it down. And it doesn't take very much. All right, so now you've got your cap, you've got your pinhole. Now, to figure out how large of a piece of paper you need to stick in there, uh, there are a couple things you can do. You can either, you know, I dug into my sewing kit again and I have a flexible measuring tape. So one method is to, now you don't want to cover the whole thing. Now, usually, I usually leave the paper in. So the paper would be go from here to here is usually about where I leave it. So I've got my measuring tape. It's about where I want it. I just run it around. And that's about where I want my paper. So about six inches. And then that's about, 
And then, then that's about six inches. So I want a, a six by six. So a six by six piece of paper will fit in here quite nicely. So a lot of my papers though, aren't going to be six by six. So I will either use my changing tent or I'll go into a very dimly lit room. And what I'll do before I go in is I will get a piece of paper and I will, as a template, and I'll cut it to the size I want so that I can just go into the dark room, dimly lit, you know, you know, whichever method I do, and then I can just go in, put the template down and snip, 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 snip. And then when I have my paper cut to the size that I want, um, I will make sure I have to make sure I put the emulsion side facing inward. And with a lot of fiber based paper, that's, you know, it tends to curl inwards to the emulsion side. So that also is helpful to know. So I make sure I get the emulsion side in. I just really, I just roll it up and slide it in. And what I do to make sure I know where my pinhole is and to prevent it from exposing until I'm ready, I will take a little piece of tape and this is why I love gaffer's tape for this because it's really easy to work with. Damn it. I know, right? <laughs> and then I'll just take a little bit of paper or the tape and I'll put it over. That's my lens cap. So, and then I've got my cap, my paper's in, it's all loaded and ready to go. So, um, you want to make sure it's someplace that's going to be really stable and it's not going to shift around, um, or it can, and, but the image won't necessarily, might not necessarily be sharp and clear as like, but you want to do it someplace really secure, preferably away from, you know, high traffic areas, um, and you also want to make sure that when, so when you point it at your scene, you know, I'd really like spend some time like observing like the scene and like where the sun is actually going to track. So of course you're going to want it to face south. Um, I use, I'll often use zip ties to secure the camera or I can use tape, uh, but I should really tape the hell out of it. And then another thing that I do, and this is really, I feel this is very important is I will actually take, print out a note and I will tape it with clear tape to the camera. And I will say something along the lines of, you know, photography experiment, please do not disturb for questions, please contact Ellen at blah, blah, blah. And um, that way people are less inclined to call the bomb squad or think that you're running drugs or something. Um, so. And do not, and don't, you know, put on something there that says not a bomb because that's not very reassuring. So, all right, so I'm going to share my screen again. Okay. Okay, so to finish the solar graph, um, like I said, do not use dark room chemicals because uh, this will, it'll darken the image, you're going to lose it. And after a year of exposure, you don't want that. <laughs> uh, so really the, what you want to do is you want to scan or photograph it and then you're going to do it in the same way that I described in lumen printing. So you either, you know, have it on, you know, a flat surface to be, if you're going to photograph it, a flat surface and have it as parallel to your camera's lens as possible. And that way you get it a nice, you know, get it a nice square um, framing. And, um, or the other method is just to do a really high quality single scan. And you're gonna, and it's really, it's not, it doesn't look that overwhelming. It's just, it's just, you, it doesn't, it's not that sexy when you first look at it. Um, so, and then you need to take your digital photograph or scan of your image, you know, throw it in Photoshop or other image processing program. It has to have an invert function. I, last time I used Lightroom to do it, it didn't really have it. 
So um, Photoshop, you know, takes care of it just fine. Um, and then when you invert it, it still can look really underwhelming. You just really have to go in and then you just play with the with the sliders, the you know, controls or whatever it is that gets used in that program to really kind of, you have to really kind of punch it up. Um, this one, it's like I made adjustments, like I increased the contrast. Um, now the thing with, on a side note, um, expired papers, like older papers, they tend to lose a bit of contrast. So newer papers, will give you more of that net con natural contrast. Um, and then you want to store your image uh, or the original like in a light proof container, or you can even stick, stick it between the pages of a book. <laughs> you know, it's not ideal, but you know, it does at a pinch. Um, and then for solography with the different papers will give you different results. Um, so this is another image that I made at the same time as this image, it's just different direction. This is actually looking at downtown Mill Street in downtown Grass Valley. Um, you can kind of on the horizon line, you can kind of see where at some point it shifted. And so it re so it has a little bit of a double exposure going on. But the contrast on this is much, much higher, but it didn't do a very good job of recording all of those really fine lines that this paper was able to capture. All, you know, that really fine set of lines, sorry, vertigo, um, just isn't present in these. So, I mean, it's a different look. I think it's just as interesting. But um, just bear in mind that just like lumen printing, you know, you're going to get different results. Um, and, and that is it. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. You're still going to look under the box, right? Oh, yes. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> uh, yes. So there's about. Yes. Oh, it's been 25 minutes, but that's okay. So we'll see what we get. And I've never tried using the slumped glass with those leaves. And so I have no idea how it's going to turn out. So, all right. Let's turn that off. Oh. Hmm. So it's turned a, you know, a nice shade of purple. You can faintly see where the glass line, you know, the lines of the glass plate are, and you can get a little bit of the million dollar leaves, but it probably, it could have used a little more time, but it also just might not have had enough contrast the objects might just might not have had enough contrast to make a good print. So this is a case where it's like, okay, well. Meaning, can I know, say it, it, in different words, meaning the objects weren't opaque enough to block enough light to create contrast. Exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would want to go back with something that's a little heavier, maybe a little thicker, maybe use more leaves. Um, yeah, but there is some... There is a little bit of detail. Sorry, it's really shiny and the lights are in the way. Let's see if this is any better. Yeah. So, I mean, there is some detail in there. There is some promise to it. So um, a solution I think in this case would be to just take a bunch of the little leaves and like maybe stack them together. Um, Example on my wall. I actually, this is another print that I did with another process, but I used those same leaves, and it came out. It came out very nicely. But I'd used a bunch of them, and they were overlapping, and that might be that might be the ticket. So, and with the one you just made, it could very well be that scanning it and increasing the contrast and so on in post processing will bring it out. And that's true. So I. 
Well, maybe not right now, but I guess <laughs> I'm almost out of Wait, no, I have till 10.15, don't I? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, let's go scan it and see what it does. All right. Okay. Let's see. Oh, good. There it goes. It seems to be cooperating now. So. Okay. So I am going to set the scanner gloss, reflective image type. So, and I'm just gonna, my scanner will go up to a, a ridiculous DPI. I mean, it's, 12,800. I, I don't need to go that high. Um, I'm just going to go in for the case of this class. I'm just, you know, I'm just going to go with 300 standard JPEG. And then when I scan, I, I tend, I do save it in TIFF format and I know it makes it larger, but it's also, or make, it just makes it a really high quality file that, let's see. And in this case, I'm just going to hit scan. When you're done scanning it and you pull the print back out of the scanner, will we be able to see that it's degraded from the scanner? It didn't do much damage to it, but I can see that it has faded a little. I'm sorry, it's really hard to like. Yeah, it does look a here, little faded. But yeah. Oh no. Well, and my scanner did not want to co cooperate, or maybe it did. Okay. That purple looks like more fun. It, yeah, no, that is, although, and I can see, actually on my monitor, that looks like, that's like violently purple. It's much darker on my screen. Um, I'll just throw it in Photoshop. Okay, so when actually when I do con when I do contrast, it's actually darkening it quite a bit, does help a little bit, so. Let's see what this does. That's interesting with the stripes alongside, that must have been from the glass table. Um, it is. And then there's some interesting textures in there. Oh, actually I'm starting to like this more than I did when I first pulled it out. 
Yeah, it looks really cool. So thanks. Yeah. Okay, and then we can like screw around with the colors. Ah, so I just put this green slider way over and it kind of turned the leaves a little bit of like a kind of a, it gave it a little bit of a green tint as you know you would assume that it should but and now i'm sliding this back to her so yeah so that's creating a lot more contrast oh yeah this is way more interesting And you can even see the tape where you tape the um, stems. I, that's true. I don't know how I don't know how I feel about the tape on there. I think I'd probably I, I kind of feel it's I wasn't sure if it would come through or not. And I I don't know. I suppose I could go and like Photoshop it out, but um, it's good to know. Okay selective color but yeah so anyway but yeah i know there's a lot that you can really do to um mess around with it and push it and see what works excellent all right so ellen some quest do you have time for some questions yeah oh sorry um <laughs> Um, so from a question standpoint, when you're placing the pinhole camera, it looked like from the ones that you showed that you had, um, from the top of your building that you had like a 180 degree view with no obstructions. So do you want, ideally, do you want to face the camera to the west so it gets a good strong solar um, sun setting response, do you want to, have, what happens if you put, if there are trees in the way, will that alter, um, how do you know where to position these? Um, you know, I kind of, I get a, so when I put those on top of the building, it was like, for me, it was like, I wanted to try and like catch you know catch the more of the scene of like like the back of the like with the back of the building it's like i wanted to get a little bit of i was kind of hoping to get a little bit of the street and then some of the tree a little bit of that in there which i managed to do um and then i also knew right about where the sun rose on that side on the eastern side of the building and so i just took my I, I just took my best guess and the pinhole camera it's going to have a really wide aperture and then also the other thing is that when the paper is in the camera you know it's on a curve and so it's really going to distort things in ways that normally would like worse than a fish kind of the same idea as a, as a fish eye except instead of concave it's convex um so and then the second one that I showed where it, the, the lines didn't come through quite as well, that did face a little bit more west. Um, but yeah, generally I try and get like a little, try to get in the range of like, not directly east, but like southeast, south or southwest, you know, try and get it to face those directions. And I do also try and kind of tilt it back a little bit. So I want to try and get the sun, as much of the sun in there as I possibly can. Okay. So, and really a lot of it is I'm just taking my very best guess. <laughs> um, but if there's a tree in the way, you know, that can actually create some really interesting effects because, you know, you get the sunlight shining through the tree. And so that can, um, I've seen some images where it almost looks like the, the path of the sun goes over the tree, like through the tree. It doesn't, it's just, there's, there was just something about the way that the elements lined up and made it look. And <clears throat> Shelby, I have to apologize. Uh, you asked a question a while ago about what the exposure time is. And I think, was that a reference to the um, panel camera or to the, a UV light box. 
It was the one that was taken in the Nevada City Grass Valley. The, the solography, the pinhole yeah, yeah. camera. Oh, yeah. um, that one, that was a six month exposure. Wow. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, I wanted to leave it up for a year, but I got impatient. <laughs> and I mean, well, six months is good enough because, you know, you get the full, you know, range of the sun. Um, and you don't, and there's not a specific time of the year that you have to place these. You can do it any time, but I personally like to do it around solstice. Um, well, I was, one, I was wondering if we could all get together and do that. I, I made a pinhole camera with a oatmeal can in 1972 in my first photography class. Oh, fun. Yeah, and then that is the other thing that I, I didn't really touch on, but yeah, you can create, you don't have to use a soda can. You can use, you know, whatever, you know, can stay light proof and waterproof and you can use whatever you want to make a pinhole camera, like oatmeal cans I've used. And it's like, I've used an actual, like a literal box to make one before. Uh, people have made them out of like film canisters and my, a very good friend of mine in Alaska who is just, uh, he's just this creative genius. He's amazing, but he cast, made a cast of his head and then he made, and then he was able to get that cast 3D scanned and then he printed all these little teeny tiny replicas of his head and he probably I think there were probably like 10 of them and so he used his own eye as a pinhole <laughs> and then he kind of scattered them all wow. throughout the Anchorage area and um it was it was genius they really worked really quite well I think he got like three of them back but um yeah, and then he actually made a large, like a full-size pinhole of his head. And I mean, he, he spent a lot of more time making that one nice because he wanted to use it on a regular basis. But, uh, but yeah, no, you can do all kinds of wild stuff. And so in college, I used a shoebox. And the advantage is, is at the other end of the shoebox, you have a flat surface. And I put a sheet of four by five film in there. Mm -hmm. And when you do have a pinhole, you have almost an infinite depth of field. Mm -hmm. So because I was just experimenting, learning the process, I put to a glass beer stein about, oh, four inches in front of the camera and then shined it out the window to infinity. And I could see that everything was in very sharp focus. And then going on with the panel cameras, um, our own David McKay uh, teaches a class at the Rockville, uh, Sierra College uh, Rockland campus on pinhole photography it's a <clears throat> what are it was sierra college semester quarter but the whole term is just about making the cameras and they get really into finding unique items to become a camera yeah. uh, that sounds fun i think i need to take that class if they ever <laughs> offer it again <laughs> it'd be great to go out a little outing with a bunch of people that want to do it yeah yeah and um yeah no and i heard it and you know get, yeah if you get them all kind of in the same area that could be you know you could get some really interesting results um oh that reminds there was a scottish guy um who rigged up kind of like a um like a frame for a bunch of these pinhole cameras that he made doing solography so he took so he probably had about 10 of these and kind of all lined them up. And afterwards in the post-processing, it was like he had this really beautiful, long, wild pano that he made out of it. So you can, yeah. So now there's some really, really creative stuff that you can do with multiple cameras in one area. So. A hat box, like a women's hat box would really be really fun. That would, yeah, no, it's got a, nice round shape to it and you could put paper all around it. that would be really fun yeah. so let's have something called evaluative meeting, metering which means that it's taking into account a lot of different things about the brightness it's seeing in different parts of the of the image and making a decision based on that um 
but for certain situations, um, like if something's really well backlit a lot, we might not want the value to be a leader. We might want to change it to a different one. Um, okay. Jimmy, um, Jimmy, is that you talking or is that your background yeah. noise from the other track? Oh, he's on mute now. Okay. <laughs> I just realized that was probably track one coming over his computer into our track. <laughs> Ellen, so where's the best place to get paper? You, you said you found them or you got them free somewhere. I did. did. Um, so you can actually, yeah, you can actually buy them online. Um, I There's no place locally, but um, I there might be places in Sacramento that you can buy. I mean, you can buy them new, um, you know, I do know for um, there are definitely places in San Francisco, um, but you can order them online. You can, like B and H has them. There's Adorama has them. Um, you can buy actually directly from the the company that makes the paper, like you, like Ilford. That's I L F O R D. Um, they actually they have a website where you can actually go to and buy from directly. And then um, Burger is another paper and they do, they, they do the same thing. Um, and Ilford is the one that makes like um, the paper that's, you know, they do make paper specifically for pinhole photography. And so they're the company that, uh, they, I mean, there could be other companies that do make, um, paper for pinhole cameras, but I'm not, but I haven't dug into that very much. So. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. You can even go on eBay and buy, you know, lots of, you know, expired paper and for pretty cheap. So that, that's, that's another option, so. Yeah, when I was doing it more, there were other names. There's Kodak and Oriental and Fuji. Mm -hmm. and oh yeah. Famous. Oh, all kinds out there. Yeah, these these just happen to be the ones that I got a hold of. So, but yeah, no, the Oriental Seagull. That's I actually got a package of that somewhere, and that's a really really nice paper. And then I looked it up online. It was like I almost choked when I saw how expensive it was, and I was like, oh, I'm using it for lumen prints. <laughs> so. This is fun, Ellen. Thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, it was really interesting. I never knew you could even do any of that. So, <laughs> yeah. And so, no, and I, I took um, an experimental photography class in, um, you know, when I was in college in art school, and it just blew my mind. It was just, it was such a game changing class for me. And then my friend that made the head cameras, the pinhole cameras, I mean, he, you know, it's like we were really good we we just totally fed off of each other that, is, that just, sounds pretty next level <laughs> no, it, 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 well, yeah no i mean there he he still like blows my mind on the regular so that is crazy yeah. oh no this is very it's inspiring to see how you know, these different processes and things so thanks for sharing oh, yeah you're welcome yeah. well we're within a minute of the 10 15 stop time pretty clever of you yeah all right woo Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> thank you. It's amazing. Oh, well, you're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. So thanks, Ellen. Uh, you're welcome. So that was our first section, everybody.